All right. Thanks, guys. Um, pleasure to meet everybody. It's the first time here at, uh, at uh, the summit. Look forward to hopefully having many more um, occasions to come back and talk to you guys. So with that, uh, my name is Mike Wagner. I'm the CEO of, uh, and co-founder of Medify. And Ian Evans, CTO of Medify. So I guess let's uh, jump on in, Ian, if you're good with uh, cruising over to the next slide. Yeah. Okay. So to kind of help wake things up Friday afternoon, let's uh, provide a, a little extra caffeinated energy for you. I'm going to give out a $20 Starbucks card, an e-gift. So I, I will need your email address, but um, for a very easy meme to complete. I'm hoping you guys have all heard this. If not, that's okay. Um, but the meme is, there is, and, and raise your hand if you know the answer. Okay, first person, raise your hand. So, there is no cloud. Boom, we've got, booyah. There it is, $20 to the man on the right, all right. Thank you. I'll, just, I'll need your card and then I'll e-gift that over to you as soon as we finish up here. Um, you know, no truer statement could, could have been made, right? When you think about um, what's been happening in the public cloud space for the last nine years, ten years, it's unbelievable. And the growth has been truly amazing. And prior to, uh, founding Med Hat, Red, uh, prior, prior to founding Medify, I was actually with Red Hat. And that's how Ian and I met. I'll talk about that in another slide here. but. Um, it's really fascinating when you see all the money and all the dev and all the effort that's gone into public cloud. And then when you look at private cloud, it hasn't gone anywhere. In fact, it's grown. Um, so it's really interesting when you consider, okay, all this attention and all this uh, incredible activity and investment happening at the top of the stack, and yet what really matters the most is where we all are playing. Um, and that infrastructure piece keeps growing and growing and growing, and yet it doesn't seem like as much attention is paid to it as there really should be, or investment for that matter, right? So um, we're trying to uh, buck that trend a bit, and so far, so good. Um, and I you know, really want to give a heartfelt thanks to the folks at the FreeBSD Foundation, because they've just been, um, and the community overall, have been amazing to work with, a lot of fun, and uh, just willing to um, you know, be open and go after things, and uh, we look forward to introducing more of our community um, from a customer perspective into the FreeBSD family. So uh, it's just a great group of folks, and for that, thanks very much, guys, for, for planning this and putting it on. Um, so what else do I want to talk about here? Yeah, so we had a really nice growth in 2022 um, from a private cloud perspective, um, and that's where originally Ian and I had kind of positioned our efforts was on edge-based um, installations and uh, with another startup that was out of the San Jose area uh, a few years back. Um, and now, you know, across the board where we're seeing these edge use cases pop up, and I mean, and this is, this is kind of part of that private infrastructure growth, um, all of the changes that are coming around with 5G, 5G NR, um, all these changes that are coming about, up, you know, with an ever connected community. Right, everybody's connected all the time. I've got my iPhone up here, Ian's got his iPhone up here. Everybody is always connected, the information's always flowing. How do you service that base? How do you monetize that base? So that's the area we wanted to play at the low level connectivity, at the low level infrastructure side of that um, on the private side. So on the enterprise side in particular. So truly a B2B play, yeah. So what do we do? Um, so initially again, it was uh, really an edge solution. Um, bare metal provisioning as a service, if you will, if you'd like to add the as a service, which everybody seems to be doing. Yep. Um, so bare metal provisioning as a service was the initial idea for Mojo Platform. Um, and we actually won a really cool award uh, when we initially came out. And, and we got a great anchor first customer, which I'll talk about um, in a minute. But from, uh, so Data Center World in Orlando a couple years ago gave us the best new technology, most likely to receive additional funding. So that was really cool. Um, and for me, it was just a matter of a CEO. I'm just trying to think, okay, how do I keep Ian happy and wanting to develop in this space? And that answer was really easy. Make sure we can do as much as possible on FreeBSD. Um, because you know, when you are uh, trying to build a product that requires stability and deep security, um, those are things that are top of mind and certainly keeps Ian up at night. And because it keeps him up, it keeps me up. Um, and so you know, for him, he had a, a history with FreeBSD that I was unaware of before we started this. In fact, when I first met Ian, it was through Red Hat, um, which was kind of funny, but uh, we were developing the solution on, on Red Hat bits for, you know, there's components of it that were in there, and you know, we got a chance to beta the 
product, if you will, almost alpha it um, at our old roles. And that was where we saw, and we knew the demand was there, but it was great to get that validation from you know, Fortune 100 customers saying, okay, we are struggling here. We need help from an infrastructure perspective. Can you make this easier for us? Um, so that was our, our first product. And then the second product uh, came along as a result of COVID, actually. Um, there are a number of teachers in Ian's neighborhood, we'll call it, broader mm -hmm. general area, mm -hmm. um, in uh, Loudoun County, I guess, Virginia. Ian lives in the, the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Those are granite mountains. Yeah, very, <laughs> got a Blue Ridge fan over here. Uh, very difficult to get a cell signal through there and there's no fiber running in there. So um, there was the need to help teachers uh, provide rural broadband so they could have uh, remote classes for their kids. So we set up um, a, a WISP that uh, eventually grew into a full Fios uh, ISP so we have um, fiber as well. So um, yeah, so those are the two products and they both do very different things, but they're both um, anchored in having the ability to provision and automate them from a day two operations perspective with Mojo platform. Okay, um, freedom to choose. Yeah, this was, um, this was a big thing that we recognized firsthand when uh, I was, when we were in our prior role. So Ian was, um, oh boy, uh, the uh, what, global architect, global principal architect for the yeah, open, open, architect. open telco group, right? Okay, at uh, WWT, uh, they're a, a big, uh, like $13 billion a year uh, SI out of St. Louis, if you're not familiar. Um, Cisco's largest reseller, big, big shop. Um, we had recruited them, Red Hat had recruited WWT in to be one of our, called it's our new Apex program. We wanted them to be one of our Apex partners, um, which were SIs that knew how to uh, deliver OpenShift solutions, so Kubernetes solutions, um, and they were able to implement them, integrate them, and really provide everything that a customer would need if they wanted to set up DevOps. You know, all again, all this upstack, really deep investment stuff that everybody's got extremely excited about, and you know, billions and billions of dollars were poured into this space. Um, so that's how we met initially, because we saw this potential to do very cool low-level stuff because of this new standard called Redfish. Um, so I'm not sure if you guys are very familiar with Redfish, the Redfish API, awesome, very good, a few guys, awesome. Alan, of course, yes, great. Um, so we were seeing this promise of open standards at a low level beginning to take hold. Um, and so it was OpenBMC, um, the Open Compute Project, it was uh, SNEA with Swordfish, it was Redfish, and we started seeing all of the major manufacturers lining up and saying, okay, we'll do this. Um, and as I'm sure you guys have seen, it's never easy to get all these different manufacturers to agree on a single standard. And then they like tweaking them and then they like messing with them and, and you know, introducing other standards in an attempt to you know, sort of have their own way with things. So to see everything kind of congeal and come together here over the last five years has been amazing. Um, and uh, you know, no small shout out to the DMTF and the great work that they've done to make that happen for Redfish, um, as well as the Open Compute Project guys and um, you know, all, all the hard work that's being done from an open standards perspective to make this all possible. So what this enabled and what Ian kind of had the foresight of seeing is like, if this all does work out, there's gonna be this potential to do cross-platform, low-level provisioning, integration, day two operational work from a single pane of glass. Wouldn't that be cool? Right, because that's one of the big factors, one of the main reasons that public cloud has grown as quickly as it has is because managing bare metal is a pain. And I guess, I think we can probably move to the next slide here. Um, yeah, so maybe we'll go back and forth here a little bit. We're mm -hmm. just kind of uh, rifting here. I sort of threw the deck into disarray, just kind of wanted to uh, talk a bit about public cloud and, and where we come in. But managing metal isn't easy. Um, so three big things. Uh, the software that is all proprietary based on the hardware. So to do the low-level out-of-band stuff, you have to sign up and purchase the agreements with the hardware manufacturers themselves, with the OEMs themselves, and it's, it's good stuff. It's, it's bloated, and it uh, uh, takes a while to learn, um, but it, it does do the job, um, but it's also proprietary, so it only works on that particular OEM's hardware. Um, now, with the promise of the hardware standards came this potential. Uh, to manage it from a single pane, and that's kind of where we placed our bets, and skating to where the puck was going to be, hopefully, and as it turns out, it, it is there. Um, so that was a, a big piece of it. The hardware piece, from a proprietary perspective, the software that sits on top of that is also proprietary, and the final piece is the bus factor. 
um, the FTEs training these guys, it, this is kind of not the cool area. It probably doesn't come as a surprise to everyone in the room, this uh, low-level stuff. Uh, it isn't where the big bucks are playing. It's not uh, Docker, it's not uh, Kubernetes, it's, uh, you know, it's not um, AI. You know, th those are all the cool apps that sit on top of all the hard work that we do to make it accessible, to make it work, essentially, right? Um, so yeah, that's the, the final piece is, is how do we not eliminate, but at least help corral the bus factor of having a single guy who knows how the systems operate, who know how the systems run, who know, you know, kind of holds the keys to the castle, if you will, from an infrastructure perspective. So private infrastructure, you know, it's another big reason that it ended up jumping over to cloud was because that was a, a safety net in many ways, right? You have a bunch of guys that can quickly get trained on AWS and spinning up AMIs. That, that's a true safety feature from a knowledge management perspective. Um, but there's a big cost associated with that. So at some point, and what we've seen across the board, uh, both in my prior role and then now with um, Ian here at Medify, there is a, a pivot moment when customers realize, okay, this is not sustainable for our business. We need to bring our workloads back in. And we've also seen some really interesting and bad behavior um, on the public cloud side of things that, you know, it, it makes you question, maybe it is important to have your bits on your servers. Um, and there's a number of different reasons why that uh, may be the case. So security is also a big consideration. It's something that we've put um, first and foremost. And one of the things that I found just amazing, and I, and I knew that FreeBSD had a rather incredible base um, from a customer perspective in terms of um, shops that have, like us, that have built their products on FreeBSD. Um, it was incredible to see uh, the gentleman from Netflix, is he? Is, I uh, can't recall, is it Gleb? Gleb. Yeah, so it, just a really cool presentation. And you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to grok 10 to 13% of internet traffic running through and on FreeBSD as a result of being uh, pushed through Netflix servers. But that's just, you know, unbelievable when you consider. And one of the things I asked Ian, I'm like, how did you get Netflix to even consider putting it on FreeBSD to begin with, coming off of, I don't know, it was Akamai or whatever, but you know, it's just an interesting, uh, an incredible motion, if you will, to take that from uh, an outside player and then to do it DIY, to roll your own and say, okay, we know we can do this and save God knows how many millions, if not more, per year, I don't know. But uh, similarly, that's, those are the advantages that are becoming extremely visible. This technology commoditization curve catches us all eventually, right? And especially from a hardware perspective, the power now that's built into these smaller boxes with smaller footprints, the things that you can do now with just uh, you know, a, a really small footprint in a, uh, you know, at the base of a tower is incredible. And a lot of that is really you know, driving what we're gonna see from a 5G on our perspective, um, and hopefully all these new monetization use cases that are uh, potentially out there. So um, that kind of brings us to, uh, I believe, the Major League Baseball. Yeah, so MLB. Um, this was, we had been open for about a year. Um, we had ported um, all the software I supported, we, we got rid of all of our original build and started from scratch, um, from the ground up, uh, built our code in Python, using Python mainly, um, and we had a production ready product we felt, it's, you know, an MVP that we felt was ready to go, um, and then we were brought in. We, we really run our business almost all through channel partners. Um, so we have technology partners, we have SIs, um, you know, we have uh, big box shops, if you will, guys that push a lot of hardware, and we've got, you know, smaller consulting type houses that we, we work with across the board. Um, in this case, Major League Baseball was brought to us by one of our partners out of Toronto um, called Arctic. Um, and they're, they were at the time, and I think they're still one of the top Anthos um, SIs, Anthos implementers in the world. Um, so uh, for those of you unfamiliar, Google Anthos is the enterprise container orchestration platform um, that came from Google. And uh, Major League Baseball and Google signed a, a big contract together, so they, um, MLB is a design partner, so together um, we were brought in by um, Arctic and then we partnered with Google on this to, uh, to make it all happen. They had been struggling for about six months to get uh, this thing put together and t they really, the big driver for them and the reason that um, we were brought in was they wanted to get off of VMware. Imagine that. Um, they were, you know, moving over to containers, um, container orchestration in particular uh, by Anthos, 
And to have this second layer of abstraction with VMware was just completely unnecessary. So as containers have kind of taken over from a workloads perspective, and it's now official, it's like 52% of workloads are, are running in containers over, over VMs now, which is an amazing number. Um, as that occurred, you know, people are recognizing, okay, what's the optimal way to run this, and how can we save money in the process, right? So obviously, the very low-hanging low fruit is, is you know, do it correctly, run it on containers, get rid of the virtualization, save yourself a bunch of money, and, uh, and then also usually gain in horsepower. So, and those are the things that uh, Major League Baseball wanted to solve, and we were able to um, accommodate them and, and do that. It was one of the, you know, very quickly they recognized the potential and the value in Mojo Platform, we demoed it for them, and I think they said, let's just go straight to production in like uh, one week later. Yeah, so they said, quick. yeah, can we just skip the trial, go straight to production, and get this thing ready for the 2021 season? So that's what we did. And um, yeah, it's been a really awesome relationship. A lot of folks, um, I guess, you know what, here's another, let's, let's do this. So another 20 bucks, uh, Starbucks card. Who can guess how many terabytes of data per game are pushed from a Major League Baseball game up into GCP for every game. And I'll, I'll give you a range. It's between one and 15 terabytes. So first person to get within a single terabyte wins. Go ahead. Boom, how the, wait a second. <laughs> Come on. Wow, okay. That is really good. Lucky seven, that is correct. Okay, $20, I'll, I'll need your card. Um, that's awesome. It's actually 7.2 terabytes per game is pushed into the cloud, uh, into GCP. So it's a true hybrid solution. Um, and the heavy lifting is done by um, our clusters. So we provision, uh, Major League Baseball provisions and instantiates their Anthos clusters from a single site. Uh, another one of the big things that was hurting them is you know, the ability to update um, operating system patches, zero day vulnerabilities in general, right? Firmware. Yeah, firmware, absolutely. Firmware on the, um, uh, with the storage that they had running. I think they had, uh, what were the cards that they had? 30, uh, it was basically LSI 3108. Yeah, LS, okay, so you know, there's firmware associated with the RAID cards that they had in those servers, in those clusters. Um, so there's a number of things from a travel and expense perspective that they wanted to get rid of. They wanted to be able to remotely manage and um, provision and day two operationally manage these clusters without having to fly people out at the ballparks and do the, uh, what, what does he call it, the thumb, the hand jam. Yeah, so, hand jam. Uh, uh, <laughs> Kevin, Kevin Backman is their, uh, um, was the senior principal architect for them in charge of this, and he had this funny, we were on a couple of podcasts together, and he, he called it uh, get, you know, stopping the hand jam so we didn't have to you know, run around all these ballparks and, and do this thumb drive thing with the BIOS upgrades and, uh, or the potential operating system upgrades, whatever it was that they needed to get done at the low level out of band that may require a power cycle, right? So being able to do that um, was something that was critical for them, and we enabled that. And as soon as they saw it uh, kind of happen on our, I think we, we actually had a demo system that was the same as they had in the field, so we just kind of showed yeah, them just, it. Yeah, we just, yeah, stage it and move it over. Yeah, okay. So anyway, that was, that was one of the big wins for us. And, and across the board then, um, you know, we've been with them now for three years, and now we've expanded to um, minor league ballparks as well. Um, and then as it turns out, uh, we just uh, were recently funded, and um, the owner of one of the minor league clubs is actually uh, one of the partners in the group that uh, funded us, so we're really excited to broaden the exposure of FreeBSD with that group. In fact, I'm going up there to meet with them next week, um, and we'll be talking about this, so I'll give them a shout out right now. It's called Title Town Tech out of uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, by the way. Um, so it's a really, uh, it's a great group, and uh, they are, um, it's interesting because they are actually uh, very closely uh, associated with the Green Bay Packers. In fact, the Green Bay Packers are one of their uh, main partners. So, yep. all right. So then, other other than that, guys, yeah. Then um, that kind of that was just a backdrop. I wanted to give you a little feel for from a business perspective um, how we got into this space and and why we wanted to put Mojo Platform on FreeBSD as well as um, our Photon router. And uh, and after after that, yep. Ian, I'll let you kind of appreciate it, Mike. Us. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, how does Metify use FreeBSD? Well, I guess going a little bit further back, um, go back in 2008, I actually worked for a storage company called Wasabi Systems. I don't know if you guys remember these guys, but they, um, they have a NetBSD shop and they basically made a hybrid NAS appliance and that was really kind of my first exposure to BSD. And ever since then, it's just been cumulative and um, all those lessons learned, everything that we did throughout the years, you know, we've kind of focused on trying to put into this product and make it as, as viable for market as we possibly could. 
And what we've uh, really been focused on with um, our implementation of BSD is moving away from Linux. Initially, it was a KVM hypervisor environment. Um, everything was essentially built around that. And, you know, we, we didn't necessarily run into a ton of problems, but there was issues, you know, with uh, rolling upgrades. You know, we had some performance issues with that. Um, some of the licensing things I'll touch on um, were concerns. So we decided to move over to FreeBSD and, uh, and Beehive. And um, through that process, we've actually implemented our entire Mojo platform on top of that, um, that platform. And it's worked really, really well. Um, so what we've really uh, focused on with it is uh, some performance optimizations in the kernel. So we, um, we started to use uh, BBR. And that's been really good. Um, we've gone through and um, optimized some of the Beehive environment so it best suits the VMs that we effectively have. And as a result, as you can see in this um, diagram off to the right-hand side, um, we have all of our internal Mojo components running inside of the Beehive environment, which consists of uh, Alma Linux. There's Debian in there. And then we also have um, um, another VM that we use for updating. But the idea is eventually we want to be able to take these once the container ecosystem piece is kind of figured out and there's a path forward, is move that more over to a native um, type of implementation in BSD, whatever that tur turns out to be. So we're quite excited about that. Um, so why do we use it? Um, I mean, there's, I'd say the first one is stability. Uh, it's just, it just works out of the box. And it's consistent, it's reliable. And we can usually count on it to do what it says it does, and it stays up for very long periods of time. Uh, performance is, is obviously really good out of the box, too. Uh, we like the fact that we can go in and we can set specific sys controls that pertain to our environment. We can heavily tune the kernel to what we want and how performant we want it. Um, and then also things like documentation. You know, we can always go into the documentation, find out what we need. It's great for developers. It's great for customers. And it just works for everybody. So we're very happy with the documentation that it provides. Um, ZFS, that's uh, just great. Um, as, as I put there, ZFS, 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 it just, uh, we use that for all our file systems now. It just, it just works really, really well. And then things like ports and packages, um, you know, we can always count on those working, you know, unlike some of the other package management systems where you're just constantly dealing with, you know, uh, stuff missing, and it just becomes a, a very difficult process. Um, so we, we utilize ports and packages quite a bit there. Um, highly secure out of the box. Um, there's very few things that we have to do to kind of secure things. Um, we have our own security controls we put on top of that, but out of the box it works really well. Um, licensing, we like the fact that it's highly flexible and we're not bound to uh, licensing structures, you know, constantly changing. You're having to deal with that and then you're having to kind of pull your product back or reevaluate it and figure out what you're going to do because the licensing structure has effectively changed. And then, of course, the community. Um, so how does Mojo work? Um, we've gone through a couple different iterations in this, but essentially what it is, it's a small deployable uh, VM uh, or an appliance. You put it in your data center, and effectively what it does, it goes out, and you specify the subnets that all your assets, uh, your Redfish-enabled assets are on. So it'd be your Dell, HP, Cisco. We don't really care. We keep it relatively agnostic. As long as the node supports Redfish, we can effectively use that. And then Mojo can go out and scan that. And then what it does, it adds it into a CMDB. It catalogs all the resources and information in that, and then presents those forward into a dashboard that customers can then look at, and they can leverage, and then deploy a specific workload on it. Um, but besides just having a system that deploys a very basic workload, like, hey, I want to install you know, FreeBSD or Ubuntu or whatever it is on this node, we wanted to add a level of intelligence in there. So if customers have 10,000 nodes and are geographically dispersed, they're spread out all over the place, and they want to quickly determine where specific nodes are that have exact attributes. So let's say they have an Epic server, and it has to meet this you know, 7300 server uh, Epic processor profile. You can go into Mojo, you can specify that, and Mojo will actually take those assets out of the CMDB, present those forward, and then you can then put that workload based on those very specific system constraints. Right, so we uh, focus very much on allowing organizations to identify those assets very quickly and use those um, effectively. So from a workflow perspective, this is kind of what it looks like from a server provisioning standpoint. Um, the way we handle everything within um, the stack is we have a, a Yandex uh, relay that effectively runs on the platform um, when the system spins up. 
Uh, there's a one-time Pixie boot that goes out. It goes out and um, works and contacts Mojo. And then Mojo would then effectively start the Pixie one-time Pixie boot process. It would boot that OS into UFEI mode, or if you have a CSM enabled, it would do a normal BIOS mode. And then it goes through a set of specific workloads. And we have those kind of like um, chained into a, a YAML format. So let's say you have um, 100 servers, and you want each server to have this exact profile. It has to have these BIOS settings. Like let's say you're a, a telco, and you have to make sure SIROV is enabled. Well, you can set that flag within that YAML, and then it'll go through, and it'll actually set those on the BIOSes within all those systems at the first step. And then once it's done with that, it then could go through storage, and it would set specific attributes in the storage card. Set your RAID, your RAID arrays up. Um, and then once it's through that, uh, it effectively boots the OS, sets kickstart or pre-seed, and then that uh, effectively loads it onto the system. And it, in which time you can actually do a post uh, configuration through Ansible. So all of our configuration management and the processes that we do are through Ansible within the product. Oh yeah, and I was gonna mention, um, we had a lot of requests initially to do IPMI through this. Um, we we kind of pushed back on that just because a lot of concerns about security and IPMI and the fact that Redfish is REST enabled and you can actually do that through a secure socket. We try to enable as much functionality through Redfish as we can so we don't have to go back to a legacy uh, construct to manage the servers. Um, as far as use cases go, we, um, we're, we're, uh, we're focused in heavily in the data center, but we're also looking at edge-specific use cases, so um, organizations that are wanting to build full stacks, like let's say they want to put like a, a full Kubernetes stack, a rancher stack, whatever they're using, um, you can do that through our product within the service catalog, and effectively that would actually build up the OS footprints, and then it would build that stack on top of it. So if you wanted to build a whole open stack environment that, say, has a certain amount of nodes, you would specify those within a resource pool. Once you do the specify in the resource pool, you can then build the entire environment um, into your data center through that uh, footprint. So um, I'm gonna go into the broadband service and we'll talk about it a little bit, because these, kind of, these two kind of connect together and we're start kind of um, bringing these two products together for a very specific purpose and that is remote edge deployment and enabling bare metal services at the edge for customers. Um, so what is it um, effectively? It's a broadband service that we piloted in Bluemont, Virginia and it's um, what I consider kind of 100% BSD based in the, in the sense of BSD handles all the routing, it does all the firewalling, we do all the QoS through BSD, um, and then we also have our core network and all the what we call micro pops and these smaller BSD instances actually run in those specific environments and we connect those together um, through standard routing construct through BIRD. Um, and when we look at that in the design principles, um, Metify is very specific about uh, limiting the amount of complexity. Um, we found just a lot of the box solutions, they um, were overly complex. We wanted to keep it um, simple, stupid, or keep it stupid, simple, however you'd like to say that, but keep it as simple as possible. Um, focus on the user experience rather than kind of the latest, greatest thing. Um, you know, we wanted to kind of step back, take a step back and look at, you know, what was the problems that customers were experiencing when they had the initial deployments and how could we actually fix that, and make it easier for the customers. So it was very much user, customer um, uh, focused experience. And then we also wanted to focus on how do we get this stuff out in the field and deploy it as quickly as possible, but do a zero touch approach. So we focused on you know, automating the BSD stack and we, use our, we eat our own dog food, so we deploy that through Mojo, it does a full uh, free BSD deployment, zero touch and then um, brings it up to an operational state in which time the customer can actually start to use that asset in the field. Um, and then the other part is we just wanted to make sure that we're um, keeping up with the value and the price points, because there's a lot of competition in this space. You know, Starlink's coming in, they're hitting the rural areas. Um, a lot of the 5G services are faster now, more um, spread out. So you're seeing the price points come down there as well. So we want to really focus on keeping the price point at a good, um, at a good level. So what were the challenges when we went to deploy this BSD infrastructure um, throughout the Blue Ridge? Um, we had a lot of issues, of course, with terrain. Um, very heavily wooded, hard to get signals through the trees, obviously, so we um, had to look at that. Um, we had a very limited budget, and one of the biggest complaints we had from customers was quality of service. 
you know, as they just couldn't get a consistent um, level of service. You know, the dreaded spinner they were seeing all the time. And uh, we wanted to figure out a way to actually eliminate that buffer bloat and actually give them a quality streaming experience. So we put a lot of focus on how we optimize the FreeBSD um, stack and some of the sys controls and things that we use to actually get it into a point where the customers can enjoy that st streaming experience. So uh, when we looked at the hardware, um, we, there were certain things that we wanted to make sure were in place. You know, we wanted to use higher quality NICs, so we didn't want to use a cheap one, so we used Intel i uh, 210s, 320s, but we wanted to keep that box kind of in a sub $250 range. So we were able to do that, and we were able to put that into a smaller kind of like IT, a mini ITX form factor, almost like a Nook form factor, so we could um, easily place that at the customer site, but we could also put it in a small constrained environment so it may have a box on the outside of a pole. Uh, where you just don't have a lot of power, you don't have a lot of space. So you want to keep it really, really small. Um, we ended up doing uh, FreeBSD 13.2, and most of the switching infrastructure was simple microtick, just because the cost is low, and it tends to push packets fairly well. Um, and then on the monitoring side, it was Grafana, Telegraph, Prometheus, and Influx. Um, and I'll go a little bit into that. And then for the VPN for customers, we also gave them the WireGuard and, and OpenVPN options that they could use to make um, connections out. So what the footprint effectively look like and where do we put these small BSD pops? Um, we have one major one in Berryville, um, uh, Virginia. And as you can see in that picture up to the left-hand side there, it was a fairly significant install. We put it on top of a large commercial building and we had two points of presence. One was a point to point where we did symmetric full gig up to the top of the mountain. And then from there, we had actually um, um, span uh, via fiber and additional wireless micro pops. And then we also had a point to multi point where we actually uh, did a um, 160 degree um, five gigger signal to the side of the mountain that customers connect, could connect into. And at the top, what we did is we put um, these small free BSD instances um, in outdoor boxes. And I'll talk a little bit about that. It's an IP67 type of box that we put in the field that's full DC. And um, you could also plug in solar options for that for customers that might not have immediate accessibility to power. And we'd be able to put um, 100 or 2 AH batteries on that. And then the customer would be able to sustain that um, remotely within the field. So what did it effectively look like when we were done? Um, the, the results were amazing. Like uh, we expected certain things, but when we actually implemented the, the latest uh, BSD install um, and we did a lot of the optimizations with the, the focus of eliminating buffer bloat, what we were able to see through, you can see this um, um, nperf test, which is essentially they go through a bunch of different users. It tells you how many have, um, done the tests per month. Um, we're actually coming above most of the national average now for the, the overall streaming experience, which is kind of a cumulative thing. It's speed, it's latency, it's um, you know, how fast the video feeds are coming through, how consistent the video streaming experience is for the customer. And beyond that, um, we uh, also found that the buffer bloat was consistently within the highest um, the highest level of um, efficiency. And that's one of the things that actually kills most of these connections is just the, the, where the uh, network interfaces and the buffers just can't keep up with the traffic. So the way we were able to do that is we implemented uh, PF with dummy net, um, and that tended to work really well. And then um, the addition of BBR in there really helped out a lot. And then there's a, a probably, I don't know, probably about uh, 60 or 70 sys controls that we implemented that were specific to the network performance, but it was also consistent to tuning the Intel NICs um, specifically and TXQs and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so what we saw here is this isn't just one isolated instance of one customer. This is something that we're actually seeing across the board with all the customers that we implement the technology for on the Hill. And what was nice about it is where you'd see a legacy service that would say, hey, I'm going to you know, give you guys you know, 12 meg down and 3 meg up. Well, what's a customer going to do with that? Nothing, you know, especially when they have to stream uh, um, video content and they're doing video conferencing, three meg up is not good. So what we did is we just opened up the entire symmetric gigabit pipe, and then we allow customers to basically flex that bandwidth uh, during times when 
customers might not be using it. One customer can use 80% of that pipe, and we're perfectly fine with it because we know dummy net, and the implementation that we did within BSD is actually going to be able to handle that appropriately. So we're really excited about the results. And, and the other thing that was, and I've been in this for a while, is the DMTS over Verizon, um, worked on that network quite a bit. And one of the things that I found interesting about this too is the level of uh, calls, support from the customers is almost non-existent. We just don't hear from the customers a lot of problems. In fact, I'm the only person that actually does support this specific network and you know, I'm here for a couple days and haven't received any calls. So, that's another part that we just, the user satisfaction is extremely high, and this is something we, that we weren't able to get when we were using um, the previous Linux implementation of, of the product. So, very exciting. Um, so what's next on the roadmap um, in terms of what we, we plan on doing? Um, on the Mojo side, uh, there's a bunch of work that we're doing in the OCI. Uh, you know, to, to maybe do some testing and things like that. Um, but we would like to, uh, whenever that is viable, start to test moving our container infrastructure over to that and then complete the transformation into BSD because that is essentially the only thing that we really haven't done. Everything else has been effectively moved over. Um, additional areas of interest uh, from us from more of a, a consumer standpoint of BSD is we would like to, you know, continue to work on that improved uh, 4G, 5G, um, cellular modem support. There's a lot of really good modem support already in BSD, um, but as the 5G NR stuff, the really high bandwidth stuff where you're seeing multi-gig speeds, those type of modems um, really do um, play into the whole, you know, uh, mobile edge compute uh, and 5G strategy. So it'd be nice to see those modules effectively supported. Um, and then ultimately, uh, there's a few ways of managing these, uh, these modems. Um, you can simply do it through a sideband interface where you're actually connecting in through a serial interface, or you can use an MVIM or a QMI um, implementation, which allows you to connect um, through essentially an API within the modem. Now, OpenBSD does have that implemented within their stack, and it's quite useful, but it would be great to see something similar in BSD at some point. And then um, probably a little extra documentation on the MPD5 piece, because uh, you have the option to use an MPD5 or PPP. For the, um, for the dialer. Uh, and then other things, like we're working a little bit with uh, NVIDIA around um, their Bluefield, which is their DPU. Um, and that's really exciting because um, a lot of the things like you know, TCP offload, um, being able to bootstrap specific OSs inside the card, and then also network function virtualization and um, software-defined networking, all these things kind of come together within the Bluefield platform. So the improved support around that is, is, is pretty critical moving forward. Um, and then um, I would say on the VM Beehive uh, project, which we utilize within the Mojo stack, it's great from a management perspective. He's done a really good job keeping things simple. That project was, was moving along really well. And I think, can't remember, but I think they were looking for a maintainer. The maintainer's not um, specifically active in that. But that is probably one of the best implementations of um, orchestration and control of a virtual platform that I've seen from a command line. Um, and then other things like OCI and then the native um, .NET runtime um, would be other things from a consumer standpoint that we see as incredibly valuable. Um, so I guess with that so far, does anybody have any questions? Sorry, did I see in one of your earlier slides that you have QCOW2 support in Beehive? Yeah, so no, we don't have it, but that was a feature that uh, we documented that would be great to have. <laughs> ah, got it. Yes. I agree. Yeah, <laughs> it'd be fantastic. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions we have. So okay. Thank you very much. Yes, it's been great. Thank you. Awesome. And I think we have a break now for about 30 minutes or so. Perfect. Thanks. Cool. Thank Thanks you. Everybody.